What if I told you that this is the same as this, and this, or this, and even all of these? And what if I told you that the story of the recent Doom games is smarter than you think? And that it was limited not by its genre, but by its developers being oblivious to what they actually created? You see, the silent protagonist archetype is much older than the video game industry. In fact, eons older. So let's give the algorithm what it wants. Hit the like and subscribe. It helps to get the word out and the machine, it enjoys it like Hollywood producers enjoy their fairy dust of joy. All oh, right, before I forget, I'll also show you how Pulp Fiction holds the key to understanding how a dramatic arc can be constructed with gameplay. Yeah, I know, they said in film school too I was crazy. So stay tuned to find out what the silent protagonist actually is and what happens when the masculine urge is not sublimated into a higher order. I know what men can do when they're angry. Psychonauts 2 was the first game I broke down on this channel, and it is a very feminine game. Nothing wrong with that of course, but I thought it would be best then to tackle a game exuding masculine energy, to give yin its yang. Because I have noticed that developers are struggling to incorporate the narrative in rather masculine games. The narrative is offloaded into cutscenes or completely sidelined into a menu even, as it was done for Doom with the Codex. Now I don't know why that is, but I do know how to avoid it while not compromising on both gameplay and story. Oh, and if I have to explain to you the difference between feminine and masculine energy, uh, well, this video might not be for you, or I don't know. Go watch old episodes of Dragon Ball, that's where I got my lesson. Now the reason why it's important for a writer to deal in both feminine and masculine energy is because it allows you to tackle the anima and the animus in your characters. This is what prevents you from writing flawless women and pathetic men, and also preventing the inverse as well, depending on one's biases and proclivities. The goal is to write complete characters as all humans have both anima and animus in them with varying degrees, of course. So let's not waste any time and jump into the story of Doom. We wake up from what feels like an eternal slumber and it takes us only a couple of seconds until we bash in the first demon skull. Less than 40 seconds in, that's how long it takes for the game to set itself up and hand over the reins to the player. Good job, id software. We proceed in hopes of finding out what the actual hell is going on. But the masculine urge to turn chaos into order cannot be stopped. I think we can work together and resolve this problem in a way that benefits us both. <laughs> Least of all with words. Enough talk. From here on we basically play a short tutorial. It lasts about 10 minutes or 2 hours if you're a video games journalist and it sets up everything. The hero, the villains, and potential true villain and all obstacles and conflict. Good job id software. As the game opens up we get to do what every man wants to do in his life. To crush your enemies, see them driven before you and to hear the lamentation of the women. But like one of the best movies ever made, this game has exactly the same amount of women in it. So the lamentations of demons will have to make do. Once we enter the UAC facility, more of the game's narrative opens up. As humanity tried to harness a new source called Argent Energy, things went horribly wrong. Of course they did. The Argent Tower released a hell wave which turned most of the UAC employees into demons. Samuel Hayden gives us Argent cells to power up our suit. Like any good bodybuilder, the Doom Slayer needs his juice. In our case, pure condensed testosterone. From this mission on I try to identify a specific narrative structure and all story beats. And let me tell ya, 
I didn't have much to go on because all the actual dramatic beats or let's say prerequisites for a dramatic beat have been buried in the codex and terminals and all of these are optional. So using Sid Field's structure I was able to identify three beats that can't be missed by the player. Two turning points and a midpoint. The first turning point being when Olivia Pierce wrestles the control of the Argent Tower away from us. It's a turning point because it shifts the story into a different direction. Now the Argent Tower can only be shot manually from the surface. The second beat is the midpoint. While it does not hold the key towards the hero's transformation, we'll get to that later as it relates to the silent protagonist, it is clearly in the middle of the game and it also raises the stakes. With the Argent Tower destroyed, there is no conventional way of shutting down the rift. So the Doomslayer must enter hell and turn the demonic faucet off from the other side. The second turning point is when the Doomslayer discovers the existence of the Crucible, which would allow him to close the rift. This again takes the story in a different direction, but that's about it. There is a whiff of a debate segment in the second act when Hayden pleads with the Doomslayer not to destroy the energy induction filters. You must stop. The hell energy is unusable without the filters. But it doesn't count because a debate segment is just a synonym for a reluctant hero and the Doomslayer knows no reluctance nor has he any doubts. He lacks trauma because he is the trauma. I love how much character is in these little sequences. Id Software managed to give the Doomslayer a lot of personality and attitude by utilizing what I like to call play don't show. From collectibles and glory kills to simply interacting with switches and levers, it all tells the story of a man looking for a fight and some fun. So the question now is why was the story buried in the codex and the terminals? Why was it stripped to this three part skeleton? To answer this we first must look at the man responsible for the game to begin with. Who he is and why he did what he did. You may not know his name, but you damn well know the fruits of his labor. You see, the Kaiser, and I'm absolutely not making this up, is a Hollywood legend, a myth, a mirage. What I'm about to share with you is deep but secret Hollywood lore. Ever wondered why the 80s were so awesome? I mean, you had everything, the best cars, the best music, the best hairstyles, and of course, the best movies. The Kaiser was responsible for all the glory of the 1980s. The Kaiser is the prototypical producer, the top G, the god emperor. Forget Brokheimer and Silver, forget Golan and Globus, it's all because of the Kaiser. Ever wondered how a group of men can line up, fire off 10,000 rounds, not hit a single thing and still look cool? The Kaiser. Ever wondered why all exposition was exclusively delivered in a strip club? The Kaiser. Or how women get one line of dialogue and even that is cut short? The Kaiser. Or how everything had to be blown to bits. And I do mean everything. <laughs> Ever wondered how to pack a foot long of homoeroticism into a movie and after watching it you come out straighter than Drago's haircut? I must break you. The Kaiser. And like any great man, the Kaiser had a weakness. Uh, it's drugs and women. I mean, come on, these are the 80s after all. As the legend goes, right before he vanished, the Kaiser's blood consisted mostly of quaaludes and the fairy dust of joy. And he had the habit of taking his elixir, well, um, straight from a lady of the night's... Uh, uh, damn it. How do I explain this with YouTube-friendly terms? How is this supposed to work? Uh, you get it. I don't need to get into details. Anyway, one day his personal shaman brought him a synthetic elixir, straight from a secret CIA lab. And the Kaiser became the first and only person to take this synthetic elixir. Now, accounts differ, but what has been confirmed is that everyone involved that night saw a massive bright light. And the Kaiser simply vanished. His clothes were the only thing left. Some speculate he vanished into a different dimension. Others say he went back in time, while also some think he got sucked into the collective unconscious. This part couldn't be corroborated, but according to a security guard at Paramount, a few days later he claims to have seen what looked like a ghostly nervous system. It appeared for a few seconds only to vanish again from the Paramount lot. Now, as someone who has studied the dark arts and has a weird aunt obsessed with weird healing crystals, 
I got my own theories as to what happened. I think the Kaiser got sucked into the future. He was sped out by the collective unconscious 30 years later into the untamed wildlands known as Texas. He then took a new identity and has been living as the man you may now know as Hugo Martin. Now, I don't have any proof of this, but something similar has happened before when a very cynical stand-up comedian vanished. He then came back as a wholesome radio host, making content for the whole family. Mr. Scary Joker. I mean, look at him smile when he talks about gore and violence. This can only be the smile of a man who tasted the best of what both Amsterdam and Hamsterdam can offer. Got that WMD right there, right there. I hear the uh, WMD is the bomb. But the Kaiser was confronted with an unusual problem. The world had changed drastically in his absence. Suddenly, men aren't supposed to shoot their way out of a problem. They are supposed to talk about, uh, what was it? Uh, wait. Uh, Right, uh, I got it. It's uh, supposed to talk about their fee feelings. Feelings, right, I think. Got it. Feelings, right. And things only get weirder from there. Women got the right to vote. I think. Look, I slept through most of high school. Women also drive now. You dumb run! Well, Stephanie, gently extend your arm. Extend your middle finger. And there is even this thing called a woman doctor. My God, a woman doctor. What an age this is. And all the young people spoke a language he just couldn't understand. We're leaving. So the Kaiser was humbled. He retreated until he found a new job at id Software. Here he worked tirelessly, day and night, trying to figure out a way to recapture the magic of the 1980s, to bring back what was lost, to bring this back. I, I wrote a blog post a while ago about why I hate video games, because this is what it does, it appeals to like the male fantasy. Shut up, silly woman. But the Kaiser had to deal with something he never encountered before, a pesky little thing called gameplay. And he could not, for the life of him, figure out a way how to combine the narrative with the gameplay. It was easy in the movies. Thanks to the Kuleshov effect, even the blankest planks of wood was able to deliver a dramatic arc. I'd just like you to start off your unit again, John. All it would take is you're coming back. This was the last time. And so the Kaiser sidelined the narrative. We're, we're struggling with the story. We, we really did. It was the last thing to fall in place because the game's going first. Oh, levels fall into place, secrets fall into place, we've got the glory kills, we've got all this stuff. I'm like, how the fuck are we going to put a story on this? You know what I mean? And, and like I said, it was getting in the way, you know, like because you stop the player and start trying to justify why he hates demons and they, they, everybody loses their shit. But little did he know that the movies he loved so much would hold the key in unlocking the narrative for the gameplay. The Kaiser had missed out on a crucial lesson. There are only two basic types of character and people tend to confuse the two all the time. These two are also mutually exclusive and it's the two-dimensional and three-dimensional characters. Most people conflate a poorly written three-dimensional character with a two-dimensional character. They are not the same thing. What makes a three-dimensional character is their internal flaw. It is the reason the hero went on a journey to begin with. Another way to think of three-dimensional characters is that they have a character spine. A three-dimensional character has a need and a want, but only when they overcome their need will they get their want. So internal change is at the core of a three-dimensional character. Now, they don't have to change. Michael Corleone doesn't change. He keeps his flaw at the end of The Godfather and becomes the devil. Conversely, the two-dimensional character lacks a flaw and their spine is underdeveloped but they still act as a catalyst for change. The difference is that the change is external. This is why One Punch Man and the gang from It's Always Sunny are the same thing. One Punch Man broke his limiter. He exists outside the hero's journey and in the infinite. That's the joke. Not again. All it took was one punch. Damn it! 
so everyone around him goes through the hero's journey instead. In similar fashion, the gang's narcissism and self-absorption is a bottomless pit. They can't go anywhere else but lower. So everyone around them changes instead too. This is precisely why two-dimensional characters make great vehicles for primordial archetypes. Your noir detectives, your man's man, your psychopaths, your ultimate warriors, your killer robots, and for that matter, any killer in a slasher film. A constant does not change, but a constant will necessitate change around it. That's why you can build a dramatic arc with two-dimensional characters, and the silent protagonist is just a synonym for two-dimensional. So why is the games industry struggling with creating a dramatic arc with the silent protagonist? Remember in my Attack on Titan breakdown how I said that every dramatic arc is a tug-of-war battle between the hero's facade and the hero's flaw? That both 3-act and 5-act structure, as well as key shot and Ketsu, are different vehicles to burn away the facade, to make the flaw visible and force the hero to change, or not. That is true for three-dimensional characters, so what about the two-dimensional ones? Here it's a tug-of-war battle between a lack of awareness and awareness. This is why in the midpoint, instead of finding a key to their transformation, the two-dimensional character finds a key to more awareness. For example, at the midpoint, the detective finds the first hint for who the killer might be. If you watch classic James Bond, you'll realize that at the midpoint, Bond discovers the true plan of the supervillain. Usually under threat of losing what he cares most about, his crown jewels. That's why it's also a midpoint, it's in the middle and it raises the stakes. But instead of finding a key towards transformation, it's a key towards more awareness. And the reason the games industry struggled with both two and three dimensional characters is twofold. On one hand, the two dimensional character is predominantly used in serialized television. This is how you get 10 seasons of Columbo without him ever changing. You just throw Columbo into a new scenario where he lacks awareness and the whole cycle starts again. And on the other hand, the classic three-dimensional way of burning away a hero's facade is at odds with the gameplay. You see, the more a person plays a game, the better they get at it, unless they are a video games journalist. And so the player will never reach a breaking point, never reach the dark night of the soul. Well, unless they are playing a Soulsborne. Unfortunately, not every game and story needs or has to be a Soulsborne, and we'll get to those games too eventually. Especially because they're the only games I know of where people play a dramatic arc without even realizing it. But what if I told you that understanding Pulp Fiction could have solved the Kaiser's quandary? Pulp Fiction is on many levels the complete opposite of what the 80s delivered. However, it holds the solution to bringing the magic of the 80s into gameplay form, and two games have capitalized on exactly that solution. So let's take a look at Pulp Fiction. You see, when Pulp Fiction came out, everyone thought it broke the mold. That Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery constructed a circular narrative non-chronologically. But what they actually did is construct a linear 5-act structure by using 5 non-chronological 3-act structured acts. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Right, easy enough? Or, no, uh, yeah, it sounds horribly convoluted. So let's see if we can make it visual. You can skip to this mark if you want to avoid any Pulp Fiction spoilers. Pulp Fiction tells three separate stories. Pumpkin and Honey Bunny hold up a diner. Vincent has to take his boss's wife, Mia, out for dinner. And Butch fails to throw a boxing match. On the surface, it looks like three disconnected stories arranged non-chronologically. So why did it work, even for mass audiences? Well, when you line up each beat across a linear 5x structure, you can see how a completed hero's journey is created, a completed and linear dramatic arc. Prologue. Pumpkin and Honey Bunny decide to rob the diner. Act 1. Jules and Vincent perform a hit for their boss Marcellus. A reluctant Vincent also reveals that he's been asked to take out the boss's wife for dinner. This is the inciting incident. Act 2. Butch receives money to throw a fight. Vincent takes out Mia for dinner. They dance and bond. Act 3. 
Vincent goes back to her house, Mia ODs and Vincent takes a huge risk and plunges a syringe of adrenaline into her heart. This happens exactly in the middle, it also raises the stakes, it's clearly a midpoint and we'll get to the transformation in a bit. Butch double crosses Marcellus and not only fails to throw the fight, he also kills his opponent. He misses his getaway because he goes back to get a watch with immense sentimental value. He returns and finds awaiting Vincent who was sent to avenge Marcellus. Butch kills Vincent only to then run into Marcellus himself. Act 4. Marcellus and Butch are imprisoned by Zed, who then... Um... Let's just say he gives Marcellus a very unpleasant Dark Knight of the Soul segment. Butch saves him and is free to return to his girlfriend. Upon her questioning, he just elicits... Zed's dead, baby. Zed's dead. Marking the whole ordeal as a Dark Knight of the Soul segment, or a crisis point with a clear whiff of death. Act 5. We are back in the diner of the prologue. Pumpkin and Honey Bunny pull their guns only to be confronted by Jules and Vincent. Jules overcomes his flaw in an act of redemption and Vincent lives to fight another day. Pulp Fiction is ordered specifically to create a hero's journey. It hands the baton between the characters and by moving Vincent's death to before his showdown, and victory in the diner, Tarantino and Avery create a classic call to action, adventure, death and rebirth structure. Each character gets their own complete free act story and by intercutting and reordering them, the writers create an overall linear five act master shape, complete with a midpoint that holds the key for transformation, to choose life over death. The script delivers a clever and unexpected happy end. I like to call this method Somebody unlocked 100% of the cerebral capacity. 100%? Yes. The pulp method. This is big brain time. And this pulp method is exactly what allows video games to tell some really good stories. Because if I can arrange a linear hero's journey with five non-linear free act structured acts, why can't I do the same with five key short and katsu acts? Well, you can. And similar to Pulp Fiction's success, people may not understand what they're watching, but they will feel it. Or for games, they might not understand what they're playing, but they will feel it, playing a dramatic arc. And two games have done exactly that. Both Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy offer a solution to our facade problem. I have only started to play Jedi Survivor, but I can already see it's doing the same thing. You see, if you can't burn away the facade because the player keeps getting better at the game, what can you do? You invert the facade instead by combining elements of both the two and three-dimensional character types. The facade is inverted with the flaw through more awareness. And the skill tree is the catalyst for this. All you do in Jedi Fallen Order is play through Cal's trauma. Each skill unlocked offers more awareness of Cal's trauma and flaw. And it all culminates into a proper Dark Knight of the Soul segment, where Cal can't escape his trauma and he must confront his flaw. In similar fashion, Peter can only become a true guardian of the galaxy by overcoming his flaw and it's directly linked to the final skill in the skill tree. Only when Peter finally accepts that his mother is dead and that he must let go does the player unlock the most powerful ability. And the same is done for every other guardian in the game. All gameplay is a build up for the dramatic arc. It's pure play don't show. So let's see what the Kaiser could have done to improve Doom 2016's story and let's see if we can give it a rating. Demigods are some of the most interesting archetypes for one simple reason. They got a foot in both worlds. A good way to think of demigods is as guardians. They sit on the edge, on the border of the mundane and the divine, between animalistic and godhood. This is why they are so often hybrids and or freak accidents. They defy the natural order, but they must make peace with the natural order. This hybridity is often reflected in their names. Your Supermans, your Batmans, your Doom Slayers. And it helps to have a little bit of a monster in you when confronting a monster. Yeah. 
and the story buried in the codex is that of a demigod. Now there are ways to make everything in the codex playable. The first thing you realize when reading the codex or interacting with the terminals is that this doomslayer is an established demigod. So we can't really go the three dimensional arc of a man turning into a demigod, instead we need to implement a two dimensional arc of more awareness. Interestingly enough, that's exactly what the sequel does. The first thing I would do is connect every bit of exposition with the skill tree. Your runes, your argent energy cells, your weapon mods. They are basically boons bestowed to us by the gods, and as such, they all should hold a key towards more awareness. So instead of reading how the Doom Slayer is to demons what a vacuum cleaner is to cats, we get to play it. Play don't show, that's always our goal here. The second aspect I would change is to make Samuel Hayden way more proactive. It's already pretty much a given that he will betray us in the end. So why not utilize the betrayal at the midpoint in the form of a boss fight. This way we get the more human element in the conflict. At this point the player is unaware of what Hayden actually is. And it also flips the surprise moment into a long segment of suspense. Because either by defeating or losing to Hayden at the midpoint, he then escapes and continues to throw curveballs at us until the climax. What this also does is create a two way street for the theme. If man has the potential to become a demigod, then man can also be corrupted by evil, hence Olivia's role and vice versa. The angelic can be corrupted by man as well. That could be Hayden's role and in Doom Eternal we do find out that Hayden is basically an angel, a maker, tasked by God himself to help humanity in its transitional period towards Argent Energy. And of course, man being a fallen creature, it invited hell instead. Now, am I saying the Doomslayer is basically Jesus? He's risen from the dead. Did you miss me? Get him! And he's preaching anything but forgiveness. No, but what I am saying is that everyone likes to imagine themselves as Jesus flipping over the tables, challenging a corrupt order. And Doom at its core is about a man challenging the established but corrupt order, just with less turning of tables and more necks. And the third thing I would change is to tie the Crucible directly to the Doom Slayer as a person, as the final piece towards complete awareness. Again, something the sequel does as well. Canonically, the Doom Slayer turns too angry to die because the demons killed his pet rabbit. Yeah I know, it's a joke based on an easter egg from previous Doom games. You can tell the Kaiser had no confidence in his story and believed that this era of entertainment would not appreciate it. That it was best to just sideline the story, but that begs the question of why write the lore to begin with. Well, because people actually do crave this type of story a lot, and it's as old as human civilization itself. So the Crucible should have been a relic from the Doomslayer's past, a family item, either from his wife or children, or even a family heirloom. And after his family was massacred by the demons, the item transformed into a tool of vengeance. This is why I would flip the boss fight with the Hellguards. Only after uncovering the Crucible does the Doomslayer have the power to defeat the Hellguards. Again, something that the sequel does as well. This way the entire gameplay build starts complete awareness for both the player and the Doom Slayer. And that's the storytelling of Doom 2016. It's um, okay, definitely one big missed opportunity that was corrected with the sequel. So let's see if we can give it a rating. Before we start I wanna emphasize one thing. The rating only relates to how well the story is integrated with gameplay. A video game can have the best story ever told, but if it's relegated into cutscenes, it's still gonna get a low rating here. We want to play games, not watch a movie inside our games. Yes, I will eventually get to Kojima's games, which I do like, but yeah, I got some thoughts on them. To kick it off, we got structure. With just the bare minimum to act as connective tissue between the levels and all the character beats buried in the codex, best I can do is 2 out of 5 Billy Wilders. It still gets more than one Billy because the structure is so well utilized it actually bolstered the pacing and replayability. Next we got pacing and tone. This one relates to all gameplay tonally. Does it bolster the story and is it consistent with the tone? Now, while the pacing may rely on a skeleton, it is consistent, effective and tells a lot about the Doomslayer's personality. But there is one element that sticks out like a sore thumb to me and that's the Doomslayer and his collectibles. Him playing around with toys should have been tied to his children. 
So this becomes an instinctive reflex and through the climax and the crucible we would become aware of him having played with his children. Absent this story beat, best I can do is 3 out of 5 Mia Finchers. I couldn't decide who to pick, so this hybrid will make do. Now dialogue and tone for the most part are consistent. Everything has a serious, almost Old Testament feel to it. In particular, Vega and the voice of the demons sound most distinct. But Hayden and Olivia would have benefited from some additional rewrites, as both sound quite interchangeable. One of them should be speaking biblically, while the other scientifically but instead both just sound clinical and sciencey with similar tones. This is just a big nitpick, so 4 out of 5 Tarantinos. Finally we got synchronicity. This is how well everything comes together. Are the enemy selection, level design, combat loops, sound design and collectibles informed by the game's premise and theme? Yes and no. This is where I have to remind you that our goal is play don't show. We want to play a dramatic arc. So while all the elements chosen make sense, most of them are not tied to a dramatic arc like they were in Psychonauts 2. I'm gonna stick to my guns here and give it only 2 Carl Jungs. Pulling the average, this gives us a final rating of 2.75 Jeff Keelys. Yes, that Dorito Pope himself is a perfect representation of my utterly unbiased rating system. So let me know in the comments what you think of this approach. And have you played any games recently with a proper dramatic arc utilizing the pulp method? I have noticed that big budget games like Jedi Fallen Order seem to handle the dramatic arc quite well. My theory is that they simply have more resources to play around with the narrative, to find the sweet spot. Which means, the faster this approach is distilled into something practical, the more developers will be able to use it. In the meantime, stay tuned for the next episode, where we deep dive into the movie, responsible for why I went into filmmaking and screenwriting to begin with. And after that, the second holy grail of storytelling video awaits, and hopefully sometime in the new year we'll get to visit Doom Eternal. Or as I like to call it, the masculine urge to... Electric Boogaloo!